We are going to be in Mark 11 this morning. We were in Mark 11 last week, and we are going to be in Mark 11 chapters, or excuse me, uh, verses 15 and 16. Mark 11, verses 15 and 16. Now, some of you may be saying as you've looked at that, well, wait a minute, didn't we talk about this last week? And we did talk about it last week, but we are going to talk about it some more this week, but, but coming from a little different angle than what we discussed last week. Now, a little refresher. Last week, we were looking at this, at this event where Jesus cleansed the temple complex, where people were coming into the temple uh, they were buying and selling, and, and it just seemed like that the temple had become a marketplace. And we see this covered in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels here at the end of Jesus' ministry, not long before his death on the cross. But we also see a similar story in John chapter 2, although the details are somewhat different. Now, I believe that is two different events, that there were two different occasions in which Jesus cleanse the temple complex, but it could have been one. But we were talking about Jesus going into the temple, and what are we to make of what Jesus did? Because Jesus lived his life, for the most part, in a pretty peaceful way, it appears in Scripture. But we have a few things that we see, not many, but a few like this right here that, that seem to be really uh, different from what we typically see of Jesus. And we talked about last week, uh, what are we to make of, of this event? Is, uh, passages like these, are they justification for us to be angry? Now, uh, last week I told you that's, a, that's something that you're going to have to look at the Scriptures and decide for yourself. There are obviously different opinions even among Christians as to maybe what we are to take from this passage. And that's what we talked about last week. And I want to reiterate and stress again that we must be very careful with passages like these, that we do not use those to justify our bad actions that are indeed sinful. Now, we know Jesus' actions here were not sinful, but sometimes I believe that people are quick to justify their sinful actions by calling this verse into question. Now, we're going to look at another angle of this verse, and really a, a, a totally different topic, but a topic that's, that's sometimes tied into this verse. I would say probably often when the topic of war is discussed. Now, the real question that we are going to look at today is, what are Christians to do about war? What position should Christians take when it comes to war? Is war a justifiable thing? Are there times when Christians need to support war and fighting and killing people in another country. Now, this won't be so much as a sermon today as a, a typical sermon, but it is a topic that I feel that's important for us to at least discuss because there are Christians on both sides of, of the fence when it comes to what we are to do with war. When wars break out, should we support those wars or should we should we should we speak up against those wars? Now, this is a tough question, and we are not going to answer all the questions that, that arise with this topic today. We simply do not have the time. And if we stayed here from now till next Sunday every day, we would still not all leave in agreement on this, on this topic. I'm quite sure of that. But as we uh, get through uh, scriptures, I, I love preaching through whole books of the Bible, verses at a time, and there sometimes you come to a passage and, 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 and uh, it might be something that we don't discuss very often. And this is a topic that I don't know that I've ever really discussed in any, in any detail in, in my time here. Uh, we have indeed seen occasions where God's people, the Israelites, went to war. We saw that in the Old Testament and particularly when we were covering the book of Joshua. And, and I'm sure I probably commented uh, on, on, on the idea of war and why God may have called his people to war uh, at some point during that series. But we're going to look at this question and look at some different passages just in our mind. Uh, this is important for us as Christians to decide where we stand based on what we believe the Bible teaches on this topic. And it's very likely that in this room today there are going to be multiple views and thoughts and opinions on this topic. And that is okay. 
If somebody uh, is, uh, views something differently than you, uh, it does not necessarily mean that they are not a Christian. Now, if somebody tells you Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who died on the cross and was resurrected three days later, if they tell you that they disagree with that, well, on that, you cannot agree to disagree. There is no disagreement that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. But there are other things in Scripture that we look at and we say, man, there are good Christian men and women on both sides and they look at the scriptures and they view them differently. And we're going to talk about that today. And if nothing else, I'm not go, I'm going to go ahead and give you a spoiler alert. I'm not going to give you probably the answers that you want today. I can't give you the, the right answer on this topic. But it is something that we need to think about. If we are ever in situations, uh, whether it be self-defense, which ties in closely with this topic, or whether it be with war... We need to have thought about what do we think the scriptures say about these topics. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. But we're going to refresh a passage that is that is often used, and that is the passage that we looked at last week. Kind of refresh ourselves on it, and then we will see what the scriptures have to say about it. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse 15. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he went into the temple complex and began to throw out those buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the money changers' tables and the chairs of those selling doves and would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple complex. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for these good words about the life of Jesus and how he lived. And God, we want to live like Jesus, but we want to live rightly like Jesus, dear Lord. We don't just look at this passage, but we look at Jesus' life as a whole. And we want to understand, God, we want discernment so that we do uh, live out your word as best we can. And dear Lord, help us to live out what we understand and what we, uh, what we understand, dear Lord, live it out in the best way that we can. But I pray, God, that as we look at this topic today, that you would help us to, to see what your word says about it and help us to make right decisions when we discuss self-defense and, and support of war, dear Lord. This is a tough, tough subject. So I pray, God, that as we look at your word, that your word would speak to us today. And I pray that we would live like Jesus. Dear Lord, there may be some things that we are unsure about, but there is one thing that we can always be sure about, and that Jesus Christ is full of love and compassion and grace, dear Lord. He left us a good example. And on things we are not sure about, dear Lord, we will never go wrong with love and grace and compassion. So God, I pray that you just hide me behind the cross and help me as I preach and teach this morning and let your words be good for us today. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Now, this passage we just looked at, as well as the passage in John chapter 2, which we discussed uh, in pretty good detail last week, are two events, possibly one event, where Jesus does something that we look at and think, wow, that's, that seems uncharacteristic of Jesus. Was Jesus angry there? Well, the scripture never says that Jesus was angry, uh, but, but we could, I don't think it's, it's, it's unreasonable to assume based on Jesus' actions that he was indeed angry in this passage. Now, we talked about last week, does this mean that we have the right to be angry sometimes? Is there a righteous anger? Now, maybe you believe that that is the case based on that passage, or maybe you believe that Jesus is the king of the world, only he has the right to have such anger. Uh, regardless of, 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 of how you may view the topic, there are some who would view that and say, yes, there are times where action needs to be taken. Now, that may be on a, on a smaller scale, on a more personal level, uh, maybe something that's going on between you or another person, maybe something that's going on in the church, or maybe something that's going on in the world. And by that, I mean a war that breaks out. Is there ever an occasion where we see something evil, a wickedness that is taking place, in which action needs to occur? And it needs to occur on a large scale. That is where one country goes into another country or multiple countries go up against another country to, to bring war on them to solve some type of injustice. Now, there are many Christians who would say that that is a right thing to do and there are some Christians who would say that that is not a right thing to do. The question is, is there ever a time for a 
just war, where we see things that are going on that are sinful and wicked, and we say we must intervene. Now, that's not just us as a country in the United States. This is every country. Now, we as the United States, we do have a powerful military, and uh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, and so oftentimes, we see the United States kind of at the forefront of these, of these conflicts or wars or us sending people into other countries? Should we do that or should we not do that? Well, that's a, a, a political question in some sense, and we won't dig into all the politics of that question. But it also is a biblical question, not just a political question, but is it biblically right for us to be involved in wars, for us to start wars, for us to step in and intervene and help people where wickedness and evil is occurring? Now, there is something that's referred to as the just war theory. And the just war theory says that for a war to be just, there are certain criteria that need to be met. There are a few things that, that if, if these things are done, then the war that is being fought is a just war. But if any of the things that make a war just are not done, then it's not a just war, and it's a war that should not be fought. Now, there, there are probably more, depending on where you search for and look and research the, the just war theory, there may be more uh, pieces to this, but there are five that we will look at today, and that kind of gives us an idea of what we're talking about. Now, uh, if you want a, a little more of explanation of, of these five, if you go to gotquestions.org and you search for the just war theory, it's a great website, by the way. You can type in all kind of biblical uh, theological questions, and they have uh, responses that are, for the most part, I believe, very good, and they will give you more details on these. But 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 let's talk about some of the things that, that may justify war taking place. Number one is that a just war is one declared legitimate by a government. That is that we should not just be vigilantes. Uh, I can't decide, you know what, I'm going to war against somebody else or some other city or some other town because they've done something that I don't think is right. The just war theory would say that war only needs to be uh, established and carried out by government. Uh, the second part of the just war theory says that a just war is an act of a last resort. That is, uh, nobody should ever have the attitude, we need to go into war. We need to be gung-ho ready for war every day of the week. And uh, that's number two. Number three, a just war is to be fought for a just cause. That is, war should never be fought just to obtain land or to, to obtain wealth, whatever that wealth may be. Uh, when people fight a war, it should be because they're trying to do something for the good, to help people or to help the world. Number four, a just war... Uh, seeks a prudent goal. That is, there is some good goal in mind that is to be reached. It's not just we're just fighting to fight and it's going to linger on for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30, 30 years. Uh, there needs to be a prudent goal, uh, not just continuous fighting, and that's what we sometimes see. And number five is a just war uh, must be fought for moral reasons, for moral issues. Now, we could we could discuss and differ even on what moral issues are, but if you see people who may, uh, maybe they are being killed or maybe they are being beaten or maybe they are being abused or maybe they are being starved uh, by another army or another government who is coming uh, on to them, that would be the type of thing when we talk about uh, it needs to have a moral cause, not just to go in and say, well, we want this country to do this or we want this country's education system to be different, so we're going to go in and we're going we're to go to war with them so we can defeat them and make their education system be different. That would not be a moral cause. Now, some would say that uh, any war that follows these types of, of, of qualifications or guidelines would be a just war. Now, I don't know that really it's possible that there has ever been a just war. I think there's probably always people who are crooked and, 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 and don't have right motives. But, but there are many wars that we may look at, World War II, where we, where we think about all the Jewish people in the concentration camps and, and Hitler and Nazi and you saw the Nazis and you see the rest of the world going to war against them. Uh, many would look at that and say, yep, that is a right thing to do. We should have done that. That is for the, the good of humanity. There are people who are being abused and being mistreated, and, and it was right for us to go in and to and to attack and, 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 and do those things. And, 
There are some Christians who would hold that to be the case, and there are some who would say, no, there is no such thing as a just war. Now, that kind of gives you an idea of when we talk about is war right, some of the things that may go through people's minds and maybe even through your mind or my mind when we think, yep, this is a justifiable and right thing to do. But when we get back to our, to our question at, top, at hand, we need to, to, to think about, is this type of action that Jesus did, is it something that we, can, that we can turn to and say, yep, this is justification for us to go to war or for us to use self-defense, uh, whatever it may be. Now, we talked about those passages last week about Jesus being angry, but are there other passages in Scripture that may show that, yes, there are times that we need to be angry? Well, in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, and I'm going to read a lot of Scriptures today, so uh, if, you, if you're not able to flip through them, uh, see me afterwards, and I'll be sure to uh, tell them to you. If you want to jot them down, I encourage you to go back and study them in context and detail later. But uh, there are a few other instances that we could look at in Scripture and say that Jesus was angry. Mark chapter 3 verse 5 being one of those. There was a guy who had a, had a paralyzed hand and Jesus wanted to heal this paralyzed hand and the Pharisees, they were always, and they were always you know, against everything Jesus did and that's kind of the context of what's going on here. And in the midst of that uh, circumstance in Mark chapter 3 verse 5, after looking around at them with anger and sorrow, at the hardness of their hearts, he told the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Now, here we see the word anger in this translation, and I realize that depending on the translation that you use, you may not see the word anger there. Uh, but, but in many of these cases, the, the Greek word that is used is a word that, that implies some type of anger. So even if you don't see the word anger in your translation, you can decide for yourself if you think that that's a, a proper emotion to attribute to Jesus in these passages or not. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28, uh, we don't see the word anger here, but we do see just in Jesus' actions, they are pretty intense. In Matthew 23, 27 and 28, Jesus says to the Pharisees here, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every impurity. In the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now, I would encourage you to read all of Matthew 23 because Jesus is pretty stern with the Pharisees here. Now, some would say we, we should never be like that toward people. Uh, we should never call somebody a hypocrite. We should never uh, apply some kind of negative title to them like a whitewashed tomb. That was a those were serious words that Jesus was using against the Pharisees. And again, we don't see the, 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 the phrase here that Jesus was angry. But if you read through Matthew 23, it appears even if Jesus was not angry, he was not at all happy with the Pharisees. And he was calling them out for what they were doing. And so if we were looking for passages that we may say, well, yeah, there may be times that we need to speak up in a way and against something. Well, this might be a passage that we would uh, look to. In John chapter 11, uh, in John chapter 11, this is a passage where Jesus gets word that Lazarus is dead. He goes to the house. Lazarus' sisters are Boy, they are, they are mourning, they are sad, they're wondering why Jesus didn't get there sooner. And uh, it says in those passages, on a couple of occasions in John 11, that Jesus was angry when he looked around. He was weeping, he was sad, he was deeply moved, he had great sorrow, he was angry. Those are some of the uh, different uh, words that your translations may use there. And so here we see just a few instances where it may either say that Jesus was angry or we may could uh, assume that from the text, but we need to be careful. We need to be prayerful when uh, just deciding what we think of these texts. But those are some texts that if we were looking for other texts to support those of Mark chapter 11 uh, with Jesus turning over the tables, uh, we might could say, yeah, there are a few occasions where we could say, yeah, Jesus, he was stern or he was angry. Now that doesn't necessarily answer the question, but does that mean we are to sometimes be stern and sometimes be angry? Well, uh, 
You will need to pray over these scriptures and let the Holy Spirit uh, lead you uh, in this topic. And so we could make a case here. And, and, and again, these passages don't say anything about war. But if we're looking at Jesus' life and we're trying to find any passages that may point us to that, that war is okay, then these might be some of the passages uh, that we would turn to because we just simply don't see uh, much teaching about Jesus on war, although we will look at one here in just a little bit. So those are some passages that we uh, might look at if we were saying, yep, yeah, Jesus might support us taking some type of action, whether it be self-defense or whether it be going to war. But another question that we might would ask when trying to find an answer to this in Scripture is, did Jesus ever command his followers to fight in such a way? Well, Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, verses 36 through 38, may appear as though that is the case, but even in the context of that passage, we cannot be entirely sure if that was the case. In Luke chapter 22, verses 36 through 38, this is not long before Jesus is going to be nailed to the cross. Now, he and his disciples, he's, he's getting them ready. He's getting himself ready. And this is, this is uh, what's taking place here not long before he goes to the cross. In Luke 22, verses 36 through 38, it says, Then he said to them, But now, whoever has a money bag should take it and also a traveling bag. And whoever doesn't have a sword should sell his robe and buy one. Now, prior to this, Jesus had sent his people out and said, look, don't take anything with you, just go. And pretty much Jesus was saying, trust the Lord. Now, at the end of Jesus's ministry, Jesus is giving a different command. He says, look, now you need to, you need to be ready for what's coming. Uh, you need to be prepared. But, who, but now whoever has a money bag should take it and also a traveling bag. Before they weren't supposed to take anything, now they were. And then Jesus says something that's, that's interesting. He says, and if you don't have a sword, you need to sell your cloak and get a sword. Now, many would look at this passage and say, well, Jesus is clearly saying that there is going to come a time which self-defense is necessary. Now, we could, we could talk about this passage for an hour and talk about the different interpretations and thoughts on this passage. We will not. I would encourage you to study it for yourself if you want to look at some of those different views. But one of those views is that Jesus is saying self-defense is okay. Uh, an opposing view, or a differing view, I should say, to that is that this passage is not talking about a physical sword, but he's speaking of the sword of the Spirit, that Jesus is speaking in spiritual terms, that our battle, or the battle of the disciples as well as us, uh, is not a physical battle that we use physical swords with, but a, uh, a spiritual battle. And this, when he says swords here, he's speaking of something in a spiritual sense, not in a physical sense. That might be one way that you uh, might take this verse or that others may would take this verse. And so he tells them to get a sword. Now, to me, that sounds like a literal command, that he's telling them to get a literal physical sword. Let's read a little further, though. Verse 37. For I tell you, what is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the outlaws. Yes, what is written about me is coming to its fulfillment. Now, some would say, Jesus told his disciples to buy swords because a sword is what an outlaw would have used. And therefore, Jesus, uh, wanting to fulfill this passage, wants it to be that when, uh, when they come for him, that the people that Jesus is with are the outlaws, and that Jesus simply told the disciples to buy swords in fulfillment of the prophecy. Now, I'll let you decide what your thoughts on that passage would be. But then in verse 38, he says, Lord, they said, look, here are two swords. So Jesus tells the disciples to get a sword, and they said, we got two swords. And Jesus says, depending on your translations, some of your translations say, that is enough. Now, is Jesus saying, well, two swords is enough to fight all the battles you're going to have to fight? Or is Jesus saying it, maybe we could phrase it another way, and some of your translations may say it this way, enough of that. When they said, we've got two swords, Jesus said, enough of that, possibly implying that Jesus 
uh, did not really mean that they were supposed to take physical swords. And when they responded, but we got two swords, Jesus says enough of that kind of talk. That's not what I was talking about. Or perhaps Jesus, knowing that he has to fulfill his mission, is simply saying, no, when the time comes, don't, don't bring your swords out to protect me because I have a, a mission to fulfill. Now, as we read a little further in Luke 22, uh, and also in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26 is probably a better passage for us to look at this morning. Matthew chapter 26, verses 50 through 52. Now, this occurred as Jesus was about to be arrested and taken to be hung on the cross. And in Matthew 26, verses 50 through 52, Judas is coming to Jesus to betray him. And it says, Friend, Jesus asked him, Why have you come? Then they came, came up, took hold of Jesus, and arrested him. At that moment, one of those with Jesus reached out his hand and drew his sword. He struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. Then Jesus told him, Put away, excuse me, put your sword back in its place, because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Now, if we're going to look at a passage where Jesus may be telling his disciples to fight back, whether it be in self-defense or war, some would look at these passages that, 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 that revolve around Jesus' sword discussion and say, yep, Jesus is saying we need to buy a sword for self-defense. But the problem is, is that when they use the sword, Jesus says, put your sword away. If you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. And some would say, Jesus is clearly telling us here that we are not to fight. Now, this could be the case that Jesus is telling us here that we are never to defend ourselves. Although in the context of what is going on, Jesus would not want his disciples to have, to have tried to have saved him at that point. He had a mission to do. He had a goal to complete. And so maybe what Jesus is saying there is not something that is to be taken uh, literally for all occasions, but maybe this sword talk that he's speaking of was for that occasion. Maybe what he is speaking of when he says those who use the sword will die by the sword, perhaps he's speaking of the harder attitude in which the sword is used. Obviously, the disciple using the sword here, probably Peter, uh, was, was probably probably angry, probably defensive, and probably desired to bring harm to the other person, although we could clearly say that perhaps he was simply defending Jesus. So it's a very difficult passage for us to consider and for us to look at, but that's one of the passages that may be brought up when we study and research and pray about and think about and look for passages ourselves as to what does the Bible teach on this topic and does Jesus ever teach anything on this topic. Now, there are many who I just mentioned who would say, yep, the verses of Jesus' anger and the verses of Jesus saying to buy a sword are verses that are clear scriptural evidence that self-defense and war are both acceptable for the Christian. But there's also group, a group of Christians known as pacifists. That is, they, they don't want to be aggressive. They don't want to fight. They want to say, nope, we as Christians are supposed to sit back, that Jesus calls us to something better than war. He calls us to, to not, not give in to those types of things or be involved in those types of things. Now, one of the greatest examples of a pacifist probably in our lifetime is that of a soldier from World War II. Uh, his name was Desmond Doss. Maybe you've heard of him before. Uh, he was a Christian guy who was a pacifist. He did not believe it was right to go to war and to kill people. And he felt that it was his obligation to serve his country and go to war during World War II. But he decided he would not take up arms. He would not touch a gun and he would not kill anyone. Well, he went into the army and, and he had a hard time. Uh, the other people in the army gave him a really difficult time about that. Uh, but they allowed him to continue to stay in the army and to continue to serve and to go into battle with no weapon whatsoever. 
And it's a pretty miraculous story that as he and his, his, his uh, troop go into battle and, and, and they are losing and they are getting shot and they are getting blown up and they are retreating, Desmond Dawes continues on the battlefield and he runs out and he's grabbing these soldiers who are dying in the midst of bullets when everybody else is retreating, when everybody else is ducking heads and cover, here's this one guy and he is running out in the middle of all of the bullets and he is taking his, his comrades, his fellow soldiers, and he's tying a rope to them and he's letting them back down the cliff. And he did that for about 100 men. He rushed on to the battlefield and never touched a gun, and never killed a soul, and never, uh, never lost his life. He was brave, and every time he, he got one person and drug them off the battlefield and by himself lowered them down the side of the cliff, he said, God, let me get one more. God, let me get one more. And what, a, what an amazing story. Now, this is a guy who rightly or wrongly, no matter what you decide if you think war uh, is right or wrong, this is a guy who was a pacifist, who said, nope, I am not going to fight. I'm not going to take lives. I'm going to save lives. And uh, you can actually, there's a movie called Hacksaw Ridge. I haven't seen the movie, but that movie talks about his life. That's what that movie's about. It may be a good, a good movie to watch if you want to uh, see more about that. But that's a, that's a pretty powerful story about somebody who had strong convictions and they lived by those convictions. Now, that's a word that we need, to, we need to remember when talking about this topic or other topics in the Bible that are difficult, is we have convictions. We read through God's Word. We all have the same Word to read through. We read through God's Word, and we come to a conclusion. Now, that's not to say that our conclusion is always right. But we read God's Word and we come to the best conclusion that we can. And we pray that God would give us understanding and help us to understand. And whatever understandings and convictions we come through after earnestly and genuinely seeking God's Word and listening to Him, those are the convictions that we must live by. Now, your convictions may differ from mine, but we can only live by our own convictions. I can't live by your convictions. You can't live by my convictions. But if we are genuinely, earnestly seeking God's Word and trying our best to understand it and we're asking God to help us, whatever conviction we have, that is what we need to live by. So long as it's not clearly against Scripture. Uh, if your conviction is, I need to go out and blow people up at a mall, well, then you need to come see me and you need to seek the scripture again. But I'm not talking about those kind of extreme circumstances. I'm talking about things like this, that we really think about, that we really care about, that we really, that we really spend time praying to God about. And whatever that conviction is, you need to live by that conviction. And that's what, uh, that's what Desmond Doss did. His conviction was firm and by all accounts, he appeared to be a very strong, mature Christian man. And that was his conviction, and that's what he lived by. Right or wrong, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, that's the type of example of what it means to live by conviction. And we need to live by our convictions in the same way. Now, for those who may say, well, I don't think that war is right. Well, there are passages that would be used to support that view as well. Some of the scripture passages that pacifists use uh, would include passages like Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. Matthew 5, 43 and 44 says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now that's a beautiful passage, is it not? A passage that we need to remember in our lives because we are tempted to hate our enemies. But Jesus said, don't hate your enemies. He says to love your enemies and to pray for your enemies. Well, that's a pretty strong passage if we're looking for maybe some scriptural evidence that we are not to take any kind of retaliation on evil or wickedness. Matthew chapter 5 verses 38 and 39, just a few verses before that, it says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, 
If anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Well, that seems to be a pretty pacifist approach, does it not? Jesus said, even if somebody slaps you, don't slap them back. You turn your other cheek and let them slap it too. Now, that's a passage that we have to think about when we, when we think that we're ready to be gung-ho and we're ready to, to, to drop the hammer and bring the pain on somebody and, and solve all the world's evil. Is that what Jesus wants us to do as Christians? Is that the kind of thing that he wants us to support? And we look at passages like these in Matthew chapter 5 and Jesus is telling us to show some compassion. And not only show compassion... But, but do good to your enemy. And not only don't retaliate, but let them hit you again. Now that's pretty strong passages, and that's what Jesus did. He's not just telling us something to do here that he has not done on his own. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, man, they were spitting on him, they were beating him, they were mocking him, and Jesus never fought back, said very few words. So Jesus isn't just saying, do this. Jesus has done this. And so when we say, boy, this is hard to do. Is this what Jesus wants me to do? Well, obviously it's what he wants us to do because one, he told us to do it, and two, he showed us that we could do it, that it could be done not on our own, but through his power. Romans chapter 12. We talked about this passage Wednesday night. You may want to go back and listen to that message online if you want to from Psalm 58 because we kind of briefly uh, touched on this same type of topic Wednesday night. Uh, coincidentally, it just kind of, kind of fell at the same time we're talking about this. Well, maybe not coincidentally. I don't guess it was. The Lord knew. But uh, we talked about this passage, Roman, Romans 12, verses 18 through 21. If possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourself. Instead, leave room for his wrath. For it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Now that seems to go along pretty closely with what Jesus had said that we looked at in, in Matthew chapter 5. Paul says, look, don't, don't retaliate against people because vengeance belongs to the Lord's. It is the Lord's to carry out vengeance, not our own personal vendetta that we are supposed to carry out. And then he says something in, interesting. If, you're, if your enemy is hungry or thirsty, then go take care of them. Now, that seems to be just the opposite of going to war, does it not? And interestingly enough, a beautiful thing about the, the, the story of Desmond Doss is not only did he save the wounded Americans that he came across, he also saved the wounded Japanese that he came across. He also took care of them and tied them to the rope and lowered them down and went down and began to take care of and help them to recover. Now, that's doing exactly, I think, what this passage is talking about on a grander scale, not just on a personal scale, but on a warlike scale. Of, instead of running into the battle with a gun, he ran in with the, with the intention of saving lives, and not just those that he loved and knew that fought with him, but those who were shooting at him and trying to kill him. That's a, that's a pretty powerful example uh, and, a, and a, good, a good example to show that this type of thing that Paul is speaking of can be done among Christians and often probably is. We know that story because that's a, a pretty powerful one, but I'm sure that happens on a much smaller scale. Maybe even we do that sometimes. I hope we do. I hope we are loving our enemies and we are taking care of people, even people that hate us. I hope we are doing good to them, even if they are not doing good. Psalm chapter 82, verses 3 and 4. Provide justice for the needy and the fatherless. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and the needy. Save them from the power of the wicked. Now, if we say, okay, well, 
we want to be good to our enemies. We want to do what's right. We want to love. That's clear that Jesus wants us to do that. We see that even in, in, in the Romans passage. But the Bible is full of lots of passages, and that's what makes topics like this very difficult for us, and we must be very prayerful in these things. Now, when we look at this passage from Psalm 82, it tells us that we are to uphold the rights of the oppressed, that we are to rescue them from the power of the wicked. Now, the, 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 the example that comes to my mind, and probably to your mind too, is the Free Burma Rangers, because that's a group that we are familiar with. Free the oppressed. What are they doing? They are taking people who are oppressed, who are destitute, who are poor, who are needy, and they, are, they have wicked people who are coming against them. What are the Free Burma Rangers doing? Well, they are upholding the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. They are rescuing the poor and the needy. They are saving them from the power of the wicked. And the Free Burma Rangers is a good example of someone living out that verse. Now, they're doing it on a much smaller scale, but even in the work that they are doing, there sometimes is, is lethal means that must be used in carrying out this, this, this passage. There are sometimes uh, things that have to be done. Lives are lost. Those wicked lives, those enemies, there are times where it is no way around it that the enemies, uh, either their life has to be taken or the Free Burma Rangers' life has to be lost. Now, sometimes those wicked lives are taken to fulfill passages like these. Is that a justifiable thing? Is that something that God desires for us to do? Is that something that God is okay with us doing? Or are there times where we need to say, I'm going to strive to do this the best I can, but I will not fight back against the wicked. I will let the wicked do what they are going to do and not fight back. And there are some Christians who would say just that. They would say, I don't care what the enemy does. Even if my life is before my eyes, I will not fight back. I will allow the wicked to take my life because I don't believe that I'm supposed to fight back and retaliate. And there are some Christians, maybe even some of you in this room, and you read the scriptures and you are convicted in that way. And by all means, you should live your life in that way if that be the case. Or maybe you say, nope, there are there are times that we must defend ourselves, our families, and that we must defend the greater good, even of whole countries and people from time to time. That's one thing that may be important for us to think about when we think about some of these things that Jesus tells us, like turning the other cheek. That's a, that's a personal attack. That's when somebody is attacking us personally. And it's probably a little easier to turn the other cheek when it's just us. But, but even in that passage, it doesn't really address a, a, the bigger picture, or maybe you think it does. I don't, I'm not so sure it addresses the bigger picture of, of, of when it comes to war, but perhaps it does. But on a more personal level, we can turn the other cheek. But perhaps there are times where we see people like the people of Burma and the people the, uh, of, of, of Germany, the Jews of the day, and uh, other people we see around the world. Maybe there are times where there needs to be some intervention. So does the Bible give us any scriptures that would tell us that there is ever a time for war and that God is okay with war? I, I say okay there because some people would say war is never okay. But are there times to where war is the right thing to do? Well, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 8, is pretty clear in what it says. There is a time for war and a time for peace. Now, it's really hard to interpret that any differently than, than what it says there. Uh, if we are looking for a clear verse, if we were going to argue that war is sometimes acceptable, well, that would be a good verse to turn to. There is a time for war and a time for peace. Now, Romans chapter 13 verses 1 through 4. Romans 13, 1 through 4. Now, remember a few verses back when we looked at, at, uh, at Romans chapter 12. When we looked at Romans chapter 12, we specifically remember that it said, Vengeance is the Lord's. 
It's the Lord's to carry out vengeance. And keep that in mind as we read through Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Okay, so we have governing authorities. We have presidents and, and all these leaders we see in our countries, and there are some countries that have kings or whatever it may be. And it says that everyone must submit to the governing authorities. Why? Because there is no authority except from God. And those that exist are justified by, or excuse me, are instituted by God. And so God has placed authorities in the positions that they are in. Now, verse 2, so then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. That is, there are times when people do evil things, their conduct must be addressed. Well, whose job is it to address that conduct? Well, Paul says it is those who are in power that God has put into authority. There is good conduct that doesn't have to be addressed. But Paul says there are some occasions where there is bad conduct that must be addressed. And it is under the authority of the government that God has put into place that is to carry that out. Continuing on in verse 3. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have its approval. All right, well, that's pretty simple. Uh, God puts these authorities into place to, uh, to, to, to take care of, of bad that goes on. And if you don't want to have to worry about getting in trouble, then be good. Be good and everything is going to be okay, Paul would say. Continuing on in verse 3. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For government is God's servant, an avenger that brings death on the one who does wrong. Now, we are not to have personal vendettas and, 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 and be a vigilante and, and start war. I do not believe that to be the case whatsoever. But the scripture is pretty clear that God does give the governing authorities power, power to wield the sword to deal with bad conduct. And Paul says that government is God's servant and avenger. Now, vengeance is the Lord. Vengeance does belong to the Lord. But, but God sometimes, I believe, and you may disagree, but I believe God carries out his vengeance through the, the, the means that he has put into place, those who he has put into authority. Vengeance is the Lord, but sometimes God uses human beings to carry out his will. Sometimes God brings his wrath on the evil and deals with the evil through human means, sometimes through wars. We see that a lot in the Old Testament, and particularly as we talked about the book of Joshua. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 says, Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors as those who, excuse me, as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil, and praise those who do what is good. So it is God's authority, and he sends out these authorities to punish what is evil, to take care of the evil that takes place. Luke chapter 14, verses 31 and 32. Now, this is an interesting passage. Luke chapter 14, verses 31 and 32. We don't really see much Jesus talking about war much, but in this passage, in this parable, Jesus does reference war briefly. And in Luke 14, 31 and 32, he says, Are what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Now here Jesus is using the example that we are not to go into anything too quickly or rashly, but we are to make wise decisions based on what we know and he uses this illustration of war. He says, look, 
a good king, a good leader, is not just going to rush into war without first calculating and seeing if they have a chance to win the war. Now, this passage may be Jesus implying that war is sometimes necessary. Uh, he doesn't seem to condemn the war here and the fact that he uses the war illustration may or may not be a passage to to tell us that, yep, war is sometimes okay. But we at least needed to look at that passage because they're, 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 it deals with exactly what we're talking about here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. For you should wage war with sound guidance. Now, another passage is pretty clear like that passage we saw in Ecclesiastes 3.8. You should wage war with sound guidance. Now, we look at Proverbs as a book of wisdom. And it's the wisdom here is if you go to war, wage it with sound guidance because it says victory comes with many counselors. So we see several passages that seem to say that war sometimes occurs and there is a right way to deal with that war. But as we saw in the passages in Romans, that that, that that war that takes place, it would appear to me, and I could be wrong, that that is to be uh, overseen by those governing authorities that God puts in place because vengeance is the Lord and God's earthly governing authorities are God's avengers as we see in Romans chapter 12, verse 13. And we see a similar type of thing when we went through the book of Joshua. And I know we talked about this. And that is we see God's people going in to take over this promised land and these commands that God gave his people to, 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 to destroy and drive out all the, the, the people who were in the land. And when we look at that, we think, man, that seems kind of harsh. But what we must remember in that instance, in those instances, is that those people who were in the land were evil. They were evil people of whom God was bringing his judgment upon uh, God's people were not just to go to war for the sake of going to war. They were going to war when God says, now is the time to go to war. Go to war. And it was God's vengeance that was being poured out on the people who were in the land. These wicked, evil people who were sacrificing their children and worshiping these false idols. So these people that God had told the Israelites to destroy were evil people. And God was carrying out his judgment on them through the Israelites. Now, does God still do that today? Is that the way God deals with problems in the world? Does he bring armies into other nations to deal with evils? And is that the way that God brings vengeance and dealing with wickedness? Well, possibly so. If God did it in the Old Testament, it's possible that God is still working in the same way today. A couple of more passages as we close and that is passages that discuss just what we talked about in the Old Testament, about God commanding his people to go to war. Numbers chapter 31, verses 1 through 3. The Lord spoke to Moses, Execute vengeance for the Israelites against the Midianites. After that, you will be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people, Equip some of your men for war. They will go against Midian to inflict the Lord's vengeance on them. Well, that's exactly what we've been talking about, right? That goes along exactly with the same type of language that we see in Romans 12 and Romans 13. God is telling Moses here, lead the Israelites against these enemies and bring my vengeance upon them. How was God's vengeance inflicted? It was through the armies of the Israelites. And so we may look at passages that say vengeance is the Lord and we may say, well, we should never do anything. But, but when we look at how God's vengeance is poured out in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, we see that sometimes that vengeance is poured out through wars and armies and fighting in that way. Now, I would say that when it comes to a personal level, we should most certainly never use vengeance. I tend to lean toward the fact that there are times that war is appropriate. It's never good. I won't say that war is good because it is not good. But I believe that there are probably times that war is appropriate and that it is God's way of, of dealing with the wicked and, and rescuing the poor. But I'm aware that there are many Christians who would differ 
in that view who would say that, nope, not only are we not to bring vengeance on a personal level, but we are not to bring it on any level, whether personally or with an army. God is pretty serious, though, especially in the Old Testament, about dealing with evil when God has commanded his people to deal with it by means of war and fighting. A good passage and example of that is 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 17 through 19. Samuel continued, Although you once considered yourself unimportant, you have become the leader of the tribes of Israel. Now, Samuel here is speaking to Saul, who was the first king of Israel. And Saul had a specific command of something he was supposed to do. And he did not do that. And Samuel is saying, Look, you were once unimportant, but now you're the leader of Israel. Now, let's see what happened, what he didn't do. Continuing on in verse 17. The Lord anointed you king over Israel and then sent you on a mission and said, Go and completely destroy the sinful Amalekites. Fight against them until you have annihilated them. So why didn't you obey the Lord? Now Saul lost the kingship because of this disobedience. God told Saul, the evil Amalekites must be destroyed. You are to go in, Saul and his army, and they were to destroy and annihilate these Amalekites. How serious was God about using Israel's army to go and fulfill uh, what he wanted them to do, his command, and destroy these wicked people? Well, he was very serious because when Saul didn't do it, he said, well, you're not going to be king anymore. I'm going to have to send someone else to be king. And eventually, David was that king. Now, we can look at passages like this and maybe we say, yeah, but God was different in the Old Testament. It's a different time. It was a different way. And God doesn't speak to us in the same way as he does in the Old Testament. And I would say that that's correct. I mean, we don't see God on top of mountains like he did on Mount Sinai with his people. We don't see God speaking directly to our military leaders as he did with the people of the Old Testament, although it would be wonderful if that was the case because then we wouldn't have any doubt, right? If God just spoke to us when we said, God, I'm not sure what to do, and he just said, oh, this is what you do, and we could hear it in an audible voice, it would be so much easier. And he does tell us what we're to do, and it's in his word. But as we see from these passages in this topic today, his word is not always as easy as we would like it to be on some of these passages. Now, if God was okay with war, if God used war to accomplish the things that were right to be accomplished in the Old Testament, then I see no reason why God may not use the same type of means today. And no, God doesn't speak directly to us today in an audible voice. Maybe sometimes he does. I won't say that it never occurs, but I believe generally speaking, he's probably not speaking to our generals of our army saying, this is the war you need to fight. We just must trust passages like Romans 12 and 13, that whoever is in power, God has put into power. And sometimes God uses those in power to carry out war. Now, where it's very difficult is that those who are in power do not always start and carry out wars for good reasons. Oftentimes, those in power carry out wars for financial gain or to implement changes in other countries that are not to be implemented, shouldn't be implemented. Uh, there are many wars that are involved in by different countries that they stick their nose in things that they have no business sticking their nose into. There are many wars that should never be fought. But perhaps there are some wars that should be fought, where people are being murdered and raped and abused, where lives are being destroyed, where people are starving to death because another wicked enemy is against them. And perhaps in those instances, war is the right thing for us to do. Now, this is, a, this is a tough topic. I know we've looked at a lot of passages today, and I can tell you we have only scratched the surface when it comes to should Christians go to war. But I would encourage you to be prayerful about this, this topic. I encourage you to look at these scriptures that I have read today. I'll be glad to give them to you. 
I would encourage you to read them in the context of more. Most importantly, I would encourage you to be prayerful to the Lord. Because if that time comes that you are ever faced with a decision to fight in war or support a war or to defend yourself or defend your family, when we make those decisions, we want to make those decisions based on the best biblical evidence that we can find. And we may look at some of those scriptures and we may say, man, I'm not sure what to make of this, but we need to be prayerful to God and we need to look at the scriptures. And every decision, not just decisions on things that are hard to understand, but every decision that we make, everything that we support or that we are against, it needs to be grounded on a scripture. You need to be able to say, here is why I think this is right or wrong. Here's the scripture that I believe says this, and this is why I do this. Now, I know that even among Christians, that, 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 that we could sit down on a topic like this, and there would be one Christian who would say, here are the scriptures, and I believe war is wrong, and here is why I believe this. And there will be other Christians who will sit down and say, here is why I believe war is sometimes appropriate. And here are the scriptures to why I believe that. And we need to be able to do that with everything that we, that, that we look at in our life. Whatever positions we take, we need to take them based on scripture. That does not mean that we will always agree. Even among those Christians, they're both looking at Scripture. They're both coming to two different conclusions. But their decision is based on Scripture. And our decisions need to be based on Scripture. And if our decisions differ from other Christians' decisions, then we must live by our conviction. And sometimes our convictions or our decisions, I should say, are wrong. Sometimes we look at a passage, and maybe you've done this, and for years you thought, this passage means this, and then all of a sudden you realize, you know what, I, I think I missed that. I think it doesn't mean what I thought it meant. And maybe there are times in our life that we change, and something we used to be sure was wrong or sure was right, we now question and say, maybe it's not. But it always needs to be built on the Word of God. And as we discuss this topic and think about this topic, I hope that you will be prayerful. I hope that whatever conclusion you come to when it comes to God's Word, that it will be built on God's Word. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for your Word. And God, this is a tough topic. And dear Lord, this is something that we must think about because God, we, we face war. We experience war in our life. We experience enemies who want to do our uh, do us in, dear Lord, and do evil to us. But God, I pray that you would help us to know how to, how to act, God, in a personal way, on a personal level. When people attack us, God, help us to be compassionate and loving and forgiving. God, when we have enemies, help us to help those enemies. God, maybe that needs to be carried out on a, on a more grander scale, too. Indeed, it does, dear Lord. Maybe that means that we are not to war, or maybe we are, dear Lord. But we need to do our best to live by your word and to be patient and to be peaceful when at all possible, as Romans 12 says, dear Lord. And God, I pray that you help any in this room that may be struggling with this topic. Maybe they've thought about this for years. Maybe they've never really thought about it. Maybe today these passages has got the gears of their mind turning, dear Lord. And I pray that you would help them as they seek your word, that they would come to a, 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 a conclusion, that they would come to a conviction, dear Lord, as to what they need to do and how they need to live, dear Lord. Let us continue to look to the life of Jesus Christ as our example, dear Lord. What a beautiful and wonderful example, God, of one who, who was not a, a fighter, dear Lord, but he was one that took a lot. And maybe there were some instances where he stood up. And maybe, God, there are instances where we need to stand up. But, God, those instances may need to be few and far between. And we need to, we need to exercise a lot of patience, dear Lord, and not be quick to fly off the handle. God, there may be some instances we could say where Jesus was a little intense. But, God, they were few and far between. And, God, the instances in our life, if we ever need to stand up against evil, 
and, and act in a way that may seem intense, dear Lord. Those things should be few and far between if they should ever be at all, dear Lord. So God, I pray that you would just help these words to kind of to kind of to simmer in our minds and in our hearts, God. That when we look at your word, that it 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 establishes our, our path and every choice we make, God, that we can say, I believe this because God's word says that. And God, let every decision and every choice and everything we do be founded on your word and let us be, be able to stand on your word and live by it as best we can because that's all we can do, dear Lord, is live by your word. So I pray that we would be in it, that we would live by it, that we would love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves, dear Lord, and that we would follow the example of Jesus Christ because the things in this world we may not be sure of, dear Lord, those are things that we can be sure of that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that we need to follow Him, that we need to love you and love our neighbors. And God, I pray that you would help us to do that, to live that out in every way we can. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for today's service. To learn more about Jesus, call or text Pastor Shan at 601-657-0180 or email him at shanvn at me.com. You can also visit us at www.enterprisebaptist.church or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ebcliberty. We hope that you have been blessed by today's service.